Okay, so thanks for the introduction and uh, for the invitation to come here and talk, Dion and Rosalie, for organizing. Uh, David Huckus, who is a former, uh, well, current colleague and a former more direct colleague who invited me originally to come and participate in this seminar series. Uh, it's a good crowd. I'm happy to see lots of people here. I'm not sure if it's because the, of the title or the s poster all over South Campus or the, or the food, since I haven't been to this before. But uh, usually it's the food, so I'll try to be some good entertainment for the next hour as everyone enjoys their lunch. Um, I know that this is the BioBasic series. I promised that I would not put in any equations. I think there's only one chart, so it's not particularly complicated. It's, uh, I, I tend to speak in these sorts of environments through stories and analogies to give you a sense of sort of the landscape of a particular area that I think you may be interested in. You may not realize how much of this is going on inside of your pocket on your cell phone or every day when you use your computer, but there's a lot in the world of nanotechnology, brain-inspired computing, and where things are moving next that I'm going to hope to highlight today. So I want to start off with nano. I know that this is a term that most of you have probably heard many times. It's becoming much more common in the sort of general community lexicon in terms of what it means. Um, and I'll just sort of go back in time to give you a quick introduction about how we got to where we are today. So if you were to flash back to the early or late 1950s, early 60s, there's a famous scientist uh, whose name is Richard Feynman. For those of you who are clearly interested in science but not necessarily in the mathematical explanations, Richard Feynman is one of the best scientific communicators that this world has ever known. So if you're interested in understanding some more advanced applications in physics and engineering and science, I would recommend looking it up. But he gave a famous talk in 1959 that imagined the concept of what we could do if we could engineer the world around us, not by making things smaller through miniaturization, but by building things from the bottom up with individual atoms and molecules, which are the smallest sort of components of matter that we understand as being stable. And this talk was called, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, and it was the first sort of time that people in a public forum imagined this idea of what would we do if we could build from the bottom up instead of from what we know now as the top down that we'll describe in a minute. Now the word nanotechnology didn't exist in 1959. He didn't actually use that term. It wasn't used in a scientific context until 1974 at a conference. Um, and the history of nanotechnology from, the, you know, from 1960 until today has gone through many different avenues. Uh, it's, it's both science and science fiction. I think that most people who are not in the scientific sphere uh, understand and r sort of recognize nanotechnology through different sorts of advertising campaigns around all the uh, fancy devices that we have or through potentially science fiction, which is a way that science is generally informed in the popular culture. And there are definitely different versions of whether they be books or science fiction films that we may have seen over the last handful of years that use nanotechnology and nanoscience as sort of one of their core aspects of, of it. Now, these, actually, I guess I do have more than one chart. This is, uh, don't worry about these charts, right? This <laughs> chart is meant to show you one thing which is that if we look at time and we look at the y-axis, everything is going up, right? So that just basically means that from its infancy in the early 80s until now, 2015, and you know, theoretically, if you extrapolate these curves, there was a growth in research technology infrastructure and the market penetration of nanomaterials, nano devices into our world. And that will continue to increase as we go along through time. So this is just to give you a sense of where and how things have progressed, you'll see it's not necessarily linear, it's, a, it's sort of an exponential curve, so that means it's changing very rapidly, right? which is why in this particular field, many of you may not be aware of how s some of these changes are coming about so quickly. How that happens, of course, is that there's been large-scale industry and federal investment in this sort of research. There are nanotechnology and nanoscience institutes all, over around, all around the United States right, that have been started basically since the 1980s, and there's been a rapid growth in this type of infrastructure to support this field of research. Our institute, as Professor Smale, Dr. Smale, Professor Smale, not sure how you'd like to be referred to, is the California Nanosystems Institute. I'm assuming most of you have seen it. Uh, you walk up, you know, past it if you happen to grab lunch at what was formerly known as the bomb shelter. Um, and basically, the CNSI is a interdisciplinary hub of research that sits in the center of the Court of Sciences. It was founded in the early 2000s, we opened in 2007, and it has a sort of unique mission in the sense that it's not an academic department, there's no dedicated faculty, there are no students per se 
taking academic courses at CNSI, but it's supporting both basic and applied research to move the technologies that are developed on campus into the commercial sector for a larger scale benefit to the economy, for society, and for job creation, right? So we have a bit of a different mission than many of the other academic uh, entities on campus. And the way that that happens, just a very quick high level summary is that we have 150 some odd faculty members from 30 different departments across campus. We do interdisciplinary team-based science inside of the building, lots of collaborations around the world with this vision of taking basic and applied technologies and moving them into commercialization. So, so the ecosystem at CNSI has major initiatives that functionally move from basic discovery into developing these technologies so that they can affect and better everyday life. Right? The areas of research, I'm not going to go into too much, right, because this is a very rapid overview of CNSI. I'm not here to do a pitch on what CNSI is, but just so you know what, are, what is around. We do have four major research areas and all the aspects of things that may come across your desk. If you find a collaboration with CNSI faculty or with the Institute, it could be because we have major initiatives in health and medicine. Um, but I'm going to be talking more about the field of information technology today. What is IT? IT is computer chips digital world that around that's sort of ubiquitous in our everyday life. So if we get back to where we started, what is nano, right? I'm going to hit at the end what I think nano is. This is a question that people ask all the time. But at its basic, most basic, nano is a Greek word, right, that means dwarf. It means small. So at a minimum, ma nano means a metric of scale, right? So we're talking about small things. And we can talk about, you know, biological systems, physical systems, uh, materials and devices, et cetera, we're talking about things that are billions of times smaller than the objects that we generally interact with in our everyday life. Now, there's no good way to tell you all these different analogies, right? Imagine the Earth and imagine a soccer ball, and the Earth is a meter and a soccer ball is a nanometer, but you really don't know how big the Earth is, right? Because you've never been in space probably before. So if you forget about the analogies and just remember that it's basically very, very small. These are the smallest scale of things, the atomic and molecular scale. This is what we're dealing with here, right? And the sort of initial version of this, when we build from what Feynman was talking about in the 60s to the reality in the early 80s and since then, is that one of miniaturization, right? When we talk about small, how do we think about things that are small? Whether we sort of naturally think of them as miniaturized versions of the, of the world that's around us, right? We take machines and we think about them as smaller sh machines, right? And this has driven a lot of the history of nanoscience and nano research over the years. There's actually sort of a famous argument that happened between a famous uh, writer, Eric Drexler, who wrote that book I mentioned before called Engines of Creation, and Richard Smalley, who is a very uh, renowned nanoscientist at Rice University that actually had it back and forth in CNE News, which is the American Chemical Society's periodical. Scientific American basically with one saying, this is what nano will be, a miniaturized version of the world. And Richard Smaller is saying, that's not possible. You can't just miniaturize the world and think that the rules that apply in the world as we know it will apply at the nanoscale, because that's not true. Right? And they had a sort of famous back and forth where they were writing essays to each other, arguing about whether or not this vision of shrinking things actually made any sense as we start to move down this path. And the basic underlying principle here is that the devil is in the details, like it is in most things, right? If we look at the left-hand side, the macroscopic world in which we live, this building, right? There was an architectural drawing designed and put forth to the engineers to build this building. And they basically built a building that looks exactly like the drawings. If you forget about what they probably value engineered out because they said they didn't need it or some small things that they moved around, the reality is that the building looks like the drawing, right? And in the same way, at the atomic scale, we understand crystal structures, very ordered periodic things that happen, right? The way nature has sort of naturally developed these materials to have very ordered structures that are very stable and very, very rigid. We can predict from a drawing something like this and actually then make the material and it looks just like the models that we sort of understand from basic chemistry and physics. Microtechnology, which is the starting point for this miniaturization concept, which is what we've done since the 50s, is basically a similar version to the design drawings of architecture translated onto electronic circuits, right? And again, it works. You give a circuit diagram, you send it to a big factory, they make you a computer chip that looks exactly like the diagram with all the wires and all the switches and all the structures that look exactly the same. 
The problem is, is that nanotechnology, if we go down this role and shrink it further, right, those rules don't necessarily work because when you start to get really, really small, things don't behave as predictably as you might like them to. Right? The fact that we are not in a world free of energy, right? It is warm in this room. Everything is vibrating. You don't notice it, right? But it, the, the table is moving. Everything is moving around you, right? There's unpredictability when you start to get down to the really, really small scales. And when you try to build things with unreliable, unpredictable bits and components, you can't always get out exactly what you put in, right? So that's the difference here, is that there's basically a crucial difference between moving from, I'm gonna sketch out some material and I'm gonna assume that when I make it at the nanoscale, it's gonna produce the behaviors that I want, or I'm gonna shrink something down further and assume that it's gonna be what I thought it would be based on this sort of a paradigm of thinking, of design, of miniaturization, right? And that's the challenge that we have. And it's not something that's new, right? Something that we've known about for a long time. You've all heard of Sir Isaac Newton, right? Whether or not you remember your freshman high school physics class, we all do sort of have, live in a world and a world experience that govern by what we would call classical mechanics, right? If I drop this ball, it will bounce off the floor. If I hit my car into a wall, it will crumble. Sort of these sort of macroscopic physical manifestations of the world. And we may not be aware of a guy named Erwin Schrodinger. For those of you who did take chemistry or physics, you probably hated him. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, you know, this is a transition from what we consider classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. And that transition happens as things get very, very, very small. Right? So these basic things that we know that quantum properties are a bit different. And I removed the word quantum from my title, thanks to Dion, so I didn't scare anyone away. And I'm not going to get too much into it, but I'll just give you some examples, right? So these are four examples of the same exact material, right? This is all carbon, right? And do we know what, what forms of carbon are we aware of in the world? Natural, pure carbon. I'm sure there are some on people's fingers in this room. Diamond, right? So diamond is here. This is carbon arranged in a very specific way. No one takes notes with pencils anymore, but this is graphite, right? All carbon. If you take a graphite sheet and you roll it up into a tube, it's called a carbon nanotube. It's a really, really lightweight, super strong material. It's actually the strongest material ever produced by man. And this is what's called a buckyball. It's like a soccer ball, old school black and white panel soccer ball made out of carbon, right? And the point here is that these are of course very small, but structure also matters. Everything is made of carbon, but the positions of the atoms themselves make dramatically different properties. I'm sure for all the gentlemen in here, if you gave your wife or fiance a graphite ring, she probably wouldn't have been very happy, right? Because even though it's shiny, it's black, right? The diamond has a very specific property based off the arrangement of the atoms. The graphite also, right? It's a lubricant. You wouldn't want to try to write with a diamond pencil because you would end up cutting through the material that you're trying to write with, right? So even though it's made of the same stuff, right? It has very different properties based on how these things are arranged. And then if we take things that are made of the same stuff and arrange the same way, but we change their size, we can actually see things like this, which is a process called quantum confinement. We won't get into it too much, but a material that are known as quantum dots that are all made of the same exact material but are just different sizes are totally different colors, right? We normally think of, you know, your pants are beige, mine are blue because there's a molecule in them that's a dye that makes it absorb or reflect light in a certain way. This material is the same stuff. Those two dyes are different. These are the same, they're just different in size, right? So this is a, a size effect, one of the most well-known ones that may seem fancy, but actually artisans thousands of years ago were using them to actually colorize stained glass windows inside of monasteries in Europe and in, in the Middle East. There are other examples in nature, things like the blue morph butterfly that actually has no pigment at all, but the structure of its wings actually captures all the light except the blue light and makes it this amazing iridescent blue color. Right? So the point being that when we start to shrink things and when we start to imagine building things from atoms and molecules, the way they're arranged, the size that they are, is not always easy to predict because you wouldn't necessarily think that carbon would all of a sudden become a diamond when you just arrange it in a specific way. Right? So if we think about matter, scale, size, and how did we get to where we are with nanotechnology, one of them is sort of a driving force, right? One of the major focus areas in nano was in the information technology area. It was in companies like IBM, Intel, et cetera, who were trying to make computers smaller and faster. And they really were trying to deal with a thing called Moore's Law, right? And this is one of the two charts that I actually meant to say that I had. 
Moore's law, again, is simple. It's not just that it's going up, but that it's basically linear. What this says is there's a guy named Gordon Moore who worked for Intel at the time, and he said that we predict that we will be able to put every year two times as many switches inside of the same amount of space, right? And that, if we keep scaling that, will make the switches smaller and smaller and smaller, and we will have higher and higher and higher performance in our electronics, right? And this linear trend, not quite linear, right? But of course, you know, they say it's linear, has basically been followed as we've moved over the last 50 years in making computers and the components within them smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So this was a lot of the motivation for nano, was shrinking stuff down because computers, as we'll see, are not particularly efficient. And we tend to get spoiled by the fact that we have tiny, tiny devices doing lots of things in our desks, in our pockets. That's not where we started from. Now, where we did start from is a man named Alan Turing. Now, I'm not going to claim that he is the only father of modern computation. There's lots of names. I can't do a full treatise on all the different players at the time. Alan Turing is one of the most well-known ones. And he wrote a few papers that were very, very influential as far back as 1936, which was talking about how you could imagine a machine doing calculations, right? It was called uncomputable numbers. It was the formulation for the first computing machinery, right? And then some time later, he wrote a machine called Computing Machinery and Intelligence, where he was pondering if you have a machine that can universally calculate anything, could it ultimately be an intelligent machine? Right. And now you may not be interested in this, but if you see what I highlighted here, you may not be able to read it. It says the imitation game. Right. So if you haven't seen it, you may be familiar with this. Right. So this is a movie that came out a couple years ago. Benedict Cumberbatch played Alan Turing. It was a really, really nice movie, highlighting how computing machinery played a really strong role, obviously, in World War II, but also lays a bit of the foundation about where computing came from at the time. So it has a storied history, right? Computing goes way back. If you want to talk about computing machines, we can go back to things like abac, what's the plural of abacus? Abacai? abacai? Just abacus, okay. So, so, you know, mechanical computing machines where you're turning cranks, right? Moving forward into sort of analog and digital electronics to the World Wide Web to personal devices, right? There's a, a storied history of using machines to do computation. But for this talk, the point is, is that for those of you who are old enough to remember, I didn't have one of these, but my dad did, right? And it plugged into the car, and there was really not much of a battery. You had a, a case for it, and you're lucky if it made a call. The difference between that and this thing, which is, I guess, this is even out of date, because this is probably bigger now, um, but nevertheless, is the fact that the guts of it have gotten smaller, right? We've been, again, miniaturizing, shrinking, 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 shrinking everything to make it smaller and smaller and smaller, more efficient, Right? Smaller equals better. We can pack more features in the same space, less power, more performance right? by making things smaller. So how do you make stuff smaller? Right? Well, traditionally, right, in our human experience, we make things, most traditionally, by what we would call top-down. Right? We take a block of something, and we get rid of what we don't want. And if you're good, you're left with a David. Right? But ultimately, even if you are that good, the finest you know, hairs that you can carve on David's head are limited by the tools that you have to carve with. Right? So we can only make things as small as the tools we have. And you know, when we're carving stone, that tends to be chisels and hammers. Right? If you think about how we could do this at the nanoscale, we do have things like nanoscalpels. Right? There's this technology called a focused ion beam, which is sort of similar to a laser, but it's not fo shooting photons, it's shooting ions. And you can basically go in and carve out material with nanoscale precision, basically going in and irradiating and removing materials to make very high, highly precise structures, right? whether they be lamella for transmission electron microscopy. That's for you, Evo. I put that in there. Uh, or you know, things like this, which aren't scientifically functional, but it's sort of a demonstration of the, you know, the artistic interpretation of this. The reality is, is while this works, it's extraordinarily slow. Right? There's a reason that we don't use these. There's also a reason why we don't write by hand every book that we read, right? The printing press dramatically improved the throughput of making <coughs> prints, reproducing many, 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 many copies. Imagine what your, you think your iPhone costs a lot now. Imagine what it would be if someone had to do it all by hand, right? So we don't want to have to deal with that. We want to be able to print high throughput. And the traditional way of printing very beautiful prints in ink, right, is lithography. Again, this is, this is an old picture, but this is not even old. You know, thousands of years ago, people used 
gum arabic and fat and dyes to do lithographic prints. This is using more sort of modern offset printing, even though I took a sort of his historical picture. We now move beyond using ink to being patterning metals. We use a technique, advanced techniques called optical lithography. And advances in this technology are, again, why at best the wires inside your newest iPhone are about 15 nanometers in diameter, right? So very, very, very tiny. So shrinking down from micron scale, if you remember that imitation game, this huge thing, if you've seen it, like cranks and wires, right? Down to the point where the individual wires are tens of nanometers in dimension, right? And that's how your phone, of course, can pack so much functionality into the same space. And what we're talking about here is integrated circuits, right? These are circuits that have everything, all the wires, all the switches packaged into these beautiful little packages that you can basically put together like modules and make fancy digital architectures that sort of underlie our everyday life. The problem is, is that you can't necessarily go down much farther. One of the reasons that we're running into a limit, as we'll see in a second, of Moore's Law is that our tool is too big, right? We're still using a tool to do that. We're using light. Light has a wavelength. That's its size. We normally don't think of light as having a size, but it does, right? And we can play some tricks but we run into another limit, right? So if we run into a limit, we can't go smaller, then what do we do? Well, if we flash back again, this is one of my favorite pictures of Feynman because I just, I think it's funny, he's playing the bongos, but he's also a generally joyous person. Flip it back, right? We can't shrink it down, let's build from the bottom up. Well, how do we do that? Well, I'm gonna again flash back. This is not something new, right? We've been doing this for thousands of years. We don't always carve buildings out of the sides of mountains, right? Sometimes we build buildings from bricks. Right, and we assemble those bricks. And it may seem trivial now to us, right, but it took thousands of years to move from a very advanced structure like a pyramid into the first self-sustaining arch. Right? Like how do you arrange bricks in a way such that it can actually perform a function that's more obvious than just stacking them? What do you make them out of? What shape should they be? How do you arrange them? Right? Like these are things that mankind had to figure out over thousands of years. And in the same way, we need to figure out how to build things. Oops. I guess the sound will play. I'm gonna turn this down a little bit. This is an example now of actually arranging things with individual atoms, right? So this is where if you search nanotechnology into Google, you'll probably see some of this sort of stuff. This is what was done very early on in the 80s, where now you're physically moving individual atoms to make things like quantum corrals over here for basic physics experiments, or writing UCLA like we did in individual carbon monoxide molecules, or making goofy movies, The Boy and His Ball. Right? Now, we don't necessarily utilize this approach, but this is some, an example of where you can, right, if we run into this theoretical limit of downsizing, we can show that you can build things from atoms and molecules. Right? And where this led to, I'm skipping over lots of history about things that have happened. In the context of computing, is now thinking about, well, what if, if we can build with atoms and molecules, can we make Right? The parts of the computer out of atoms and molecules. Right? Switches, wires, etc. It's called molecular electronics. It was a huge area. It still continues to be a pretty hot area, but it was a huge area in the early 2000s. This is why one of the areas that CNSI's founding was from Hewlett Packard and companies like Intel and IBM that were trying to figure out new ways to merge chemistry and engineering to make these sorts of things. The problem with molecular electronics, I'm not going to ask you, but if you remember what we said, the devil is in the details, is that these things don't always behave as you might like them to. This is a very pretty picture, right? But if you stick that molecule in that space, it doesn't always act exactly like you might think it would, just because you have some general sense of its properties, right? So it gets tricky to do these sorts of things, and it's why molecular electronics has hit a bit of a wall. It still continues to be an active area of research, but it's faced some challenges of, of sort of recognizing its own reality. When you rely on unreliable things, don't be surprised if what you get out is unreliable, right? So Moore's Law, right? Beautiful chart going for 50 years. Everyone has been predicting it's going to die for the last 20 years, and people keep figuring out how to not make it die, right? There's a bit of a consensus at this point that it actually is probably going to not necessarily die, but not keep following that trend. And we're going to run into an issue due to various challenges that continuing to just make smaller and smaller things and packing them into smaller and smaller places may not be the best approach, right? So what we see now is instead of sort of going down this path of just continuing to shrink stuff is rethinking about what a computer is and how it works. So there's lots of history in this area as well. Um, there's a large national initiative that was announced last year, 
for Future Computing by the OSTP, which is the Office of Science and Technology of the President, and it has all the major funding agencies involved. That's basically challenging us to rethink about how computers work and how they're going to work in the future. So why do we need to rethink it, right? Well, this guy is another famous person that I will mention and point out. His name is John von Neumann. You may not have heard of him, but he's probably one of the most brilliant thinkers of the 20th century. He was the person who basically took Turing's ideas and turned them into a physical architecture that could implement computing. Every device that you have in your pockets and on your laptops is running a von Neumann architecture. Right? And what we see is that basically it's very good at certain things. It's very fast, it's reliable, it's ordered, it gives you exactly what you want, and it can work really, really well when the data that you give it is well defined. But the problem is, is that that makes it rigid, it can't struggle with messy information, and it has a bottleneck. Because what happens in the von Neumann machine is that processing happens over here, decisions, memory is over here. So if you imagine that every time you had to do something, you had to ask somebody else, right? Back and forth. Is that an efficient process? Every time you need to make a decision? You couldn't, you have no memory, right? You just go over here, you ask, what did you remember about that? Then you have to make a decision, and then you have to go back, right? It's called a bottleneck. We all know how that goes, right? Everyone has to stop at the freeway, right, to get through. There's a bottleneck that's there, and there's no way to avoid it on this classical architecture. It's one of the biggest challenges that we face in terms of making things better for computing. Add to that the fact that we know that there's more to life than ones and zeros. Not everything is captured in digital computers, right? There's, I mean, the essence of our world is not just, can't be captured and written as a string of ones and zeros, right? There's something about the brain that is fundamentally different than the way that our computers work now. And this is not a new idea, right? Again, Alan Turing, flashback, wrote a famous paper that people said was crazy and wasn't actually published until after he died but it's basically called Intelligent Machinery, A Heretical Theory. And this was written in the 50s, published not until after his death in the 90s. But it's basically the idea of, can machines exhibit intelligent behavior? And for those of you who have seen Ex Machina, you would remember that um, they were running a thing called the Turing test, right? To try to figure out, can you tell the difference between a machine and a computer if you don't know that it's a machine and a computer, right? And this is a sort of test that's there. And the history of trying to do artificial intelligence or neuromorphic computing right, is, again, another storied history that I don't have time to go into. It's been going on since the 70s and the 80s. Started up by a guy named Carver Mead at Caltech in the world of neuromorphics. Artificial intelligence has been around for a really long time. But the sort of story here is, is that can we think about instantiating how it is that the brain does things into a synthetic machine? right? It's a history of fits and starts because there's been lots of activity and excitement and then it falls off. And then there's history and there's breakthroughs and then it falls off. We're currently in the midst of one of those excitement periods, which is probably why I'm sitting here talking to you about it. And the sort of version of what we're talking about now is a thing called machine learning, right? Now, machine learning is one of the things that's happening all the time right now. Your phone is doing it even when you're not paying attention to it, right? This is how Amazon knows what to advertise to you. It's how Netflix knows what movie you might like, right? It's how Facebook decides how to populate your feed. It's basically taking all of the information from all the devices, all the sensors, all the interactions with our digital world and processing it through a machine that instead of being programmed to do one thing, learns from the data that it experiences, right? Now, of course, it has some boundaries. We have to, it, it's not just an you know, intelligent machine that does it all by itself, but you sort of set the stage and you give it tons and tons of information, and these machines right, generate advanced understanding of the information they've been provided. Now, it's all well and good that you can do computation without having to program a computer. This is a massive breakthrough in terms of what has been done over the last 30 years in computing. It's great, but you need tons of data Right? which is why the names of the companies that have to theoretically play nice in the sandbox are all the companies that sort of permeate your everyday life. Right? These are all the companies that if you sat back and thought are all gathering data about you as much as they can whenever you let them or sometimes maybe when you don't let them. Right? And they're using all that data to optimize and improve their algorithms, right? the software that controls the way in which it interacts with you to make it so seamless that you don't even know that it's interacting with you, right? The machine is learning from our interaction. And that's all well and good, right? Assuming we have lots of data, right? 
And of course, you need a supercomputer, right? So none of this is happening inside your phone. It's happening on a huge computer somewhere. The cloud is not actually a cloud. It's a physical machine, right, somewhere. And it's a g massive warehouse full of racks and racks and rows of servers that eat up lots of energy. And we'll talk about that in a second. So machine learning is great, right? But the challenge is, is that it doesn't necessarily deal well, because it's still a von Neumann machine, with increasing complexity, right? I said before, there's more to life than ones and zeros, right? And that is true. Not everything can be described very simply. The interactions of people, the world around them, the complexity of data from multiple different types of sensors, and your camera has a totally different type of data than this microphone does. How do you integrate those two data streams together? And that's a pretty simple task, right? How do you do that then when you've got thousands and thousands of different types of data that every one person is generating and collecting that data from millions and billions of people, right? You get to have a scenario where we have a lot of what's considered environmental complexity, right? And the complexity of the machines that you need to be able to process this, this is not sustainable, right? We don't want the complexity to continue to increase in the machinery, right? We want to figure out some way where we can sort of flatten that curve, right? So we can make increasingly complex calculations with machines that don't necessarily continue to grow exponentially in their complexity. And this is true, as I just mentioned before, because everything in the world right, is complex, even if it's very simple things. Right? The simplest bits, when you start, even if you understand one person, you don't know how that person is going to interact with another person or in a room of people, right? or how birds, we know how one bird flies, but why do birds form flocks and swarm? Right? Like, why do all of these sort of emergent properties come out of com the complex interactions of natural systems? Machine learning has a really hard time with dealing with this side of the world, right? It's doing better, but it struggles with it. Now, there's a lot of efforts to go on, and I'm not going to get into the gory details. This is just to give you a sense of there's some really big amounts of money, right, for research administration being dropped into this space. Billions of dollars of research, right, and this is not even showing what the companies are doing because they don't advertise what they're doing. The two that you may be familiar with are going to be the Brain Initiative, Right? And the Human Brain Project, right? which is the two uh, sort of ones that have gotten the most press lately. But there are some other small ones that leverage those, and then a bunch of companies that are actually doing some things. And how we move now from computing to the brain right, is obviously the fact that we want to understand how is it that we do all these things? How is it that I can interact with all this different multisensory information and process it in real time? Right? And the computer that fills the size of this room struggles with it. How do we figure out how to make computers be able to do what we do all the time? And one of the easiest places to start is to try to understand how our brain does it, right? Because it's the most obvious analogy to processing this type of data in a very efficient way, right? So we're now talking very much between what was the world of engineers and computer scientists with neuroscientists, whether cognitive, computational, philosophers, all different areas about how it is, what is the mind, what is intelligence, how does it work, right? And it's really trying to lay the groundwork for not only understanding the brain, and what its dynamics are, but also utilizing that information to design new computing architectures that can do what the brain does in a physical instantiation that is synthetic. So to give you some examples, nanotechnology plays a major role in this space. One is understanding the structural complexity of the brain. So this was published last year in Science. This is the first ever um, basically three-dimensional reconstruction of a rat brain, including every different type of cell. This was done through various types of electron and optical microscopy that basically went in and sliced up the brain and looked at every different type of cell and reconstructed it into a three-dimensional unit. So now that we know physically at the cellular level what the brain physically looks like, in many cases this is what's called the connectome, the connections within the brain of all the different types of signals that move. We're not necessarily only interested in the structure of the brain, but also the dynamics of how the brain works, right? So this is a, some data um, that was not from Harvard. I can't remember who did this. Oh, UCSF, that's why I wrote it there. Good. <laughs> okay. So they basically took structural information of the brain. They combined it with EEG and uh, diffusion tensor imaging inside of a functional MRI. And now they can generate simulated reconstructions of not only the structure, but how information flows through the brain. And because it's functional MRI, they can do it while performing tasks, right? So again, understanding the structure and dynamics of how the brain functions and how it works with the hope of trying to draw some inspiration of this into designing next generation computers. We also do things in nanospace where we now have really, really advanced microscopes that this is a, what's called a light sheet microscope. This is able to capture hundreds of thousands of frames per second 
in a freely live moving organism and actually watching how the neural signals move through its body. So you'll see here in a few seconds when you flash a light onto the optic nerve of this zebrafish, you'll see the calcium receptor, or it should have gone boom, big waves, right? You can actually monitor now in real time how information flows through an entire organism while it's alive and receiving stimulus, right? So nanotechnology, advanced characterization techniques still plays a major role in the brain <coughs> initiative, the human brain project, understanding the structure and dynamics of the brain. The flip side of it, instead of just measuring brains, is to simulate brains, right? To take what we already know and to port that onto a computer. Now that sounds fantastical, and it is. We move from things that we're generally familiar with chips, little computer chips, and we scale them up into these massive systems, right, that fill up the size of the rooms. And if you have enough money, you can fill a whole room full of IBM Power 750 servers, right, and you can simulate basically, I don't know, a grain of a rat's brain for like a couple seconds, right? And you really don't do exactly everything that's happening in the rat's brain. You sort of, you know, you, you take out some of the stuff that you don't need, right? But you can basically simulate the dynamics of the brain in a machine that's this large, right, for a very small period of time using advanced traditional computers, supercomputers. Now, why does that matter? Well, because you, you, I didn't know what you were gonna have for lunch today, right? I thought maybe we would have turkey sandwiches, but nevertheless, your brain works on a sandwich, right? You sit here today, hopefully it works on a sandwich. Maybe you need a coffee, but <laughs> nevertheless, it works on a sandwich, about 20 watts of power, right? Not that much power, right? To do all the things that we're doing. That supercomputer that I just showed you would require, and this is, you know, just to give you a sense of solar, an entire field, right, 10 megawatts of power, right? So that is now going to be a million times more power just to run in its resting state, right? So you sitting here right now, resting state, 20, 20 watts. This thing, 10 megawatts to run that computer, right? So it's clearly not sustainable to take this sort of approach. If every person needs one of these, we're in deep weeds, right? And this just gives you an example that there's projections that if we continue along where we are, right, benchmark system or our current systems that in 2040-ish, our computers will require more energy than the entire Earth produces at any one moment, right? So we will not be able to power these machines. We will use all the power that we produce to power our computers, right? So this is not sustainable, right? So if we flash back, we have this problem. We have a bunch of architectural issues. We may also have some material issues. This is where we re-enter back into nano, right? So now, the focus is how do we leverage the ability of nanomaterials to be very small, very energy efficient, and scalable to solve some of these problems, right? So one of the areas that's been really hot over the last five years or so is now taking what was done and called artificial neural networks. It was sort of a predecessor to deep learning and machine learning and think about how do we do that in physical hardware, right? Because now Google runs it on a huge machine. It's not efficient. How do we run it on hardware that's designed to do this, right? We need the bits that mimic the brain in such a way. So there's a whole huge area. Uh, this is some of the work that I'm specifically involved in, in generating what are called synthetic synapses, trying to make materials that have the behavior of synapses in your brain and neurons in your brain, but making those out of nanoscale elements that are generally made out of metal and other insulating semiconductor materials so that we can fabricate them using traditional processes but make them really, really efficient. Don't worry about what this is. You guys have all heard of a resistor before, right? You may not know what a capacitor or inductor are, but this is basically a box that shows that there are four fundamental circuit elements, right? If you went and took an electricity and magnetism course, you would learn about the fundamental circuit elements. But for a long time, there was one that was blank. It's about 10 years ago, there was a discovery of this thing called a memristor. Right? It's called a memory resistor. So it's a resistor that remembers what its state was before. This is the basis for the synthetic synapse. Right? You can analogize this behavior to what a synapse does. You go back to things like heavy and plasticity. Right? The, the neurons that fire together wire together, right? The more you stimulate it, the longer it memory, you, you strengthen or weaken the connections between neurons based on its history of stimulus. These little memristor elements do the same thing. The more energy you give them, the more often you stimulate them, the stronger their memory becomes. If you actually influence them the other way, you can make them forget, right? So there's sort of inorganic analogies to a synapse. And for those of you in the biological neurosciences, they can actually do spike timing dependent plasticity. They can do integrate and fire. They can do all these different things, right? By making 
these little materials that don't look like brains at all, right? Again, these are tiny little wires, right? Like all high density arrays of wires that at the basis of them, every one of these little junctions is one of these little synapses, right? So we can shrink these down, right? And make very, very high density, super efficient types of processors. Where the most recent example is a thing called IBM's True North, right? So this is a processor that they developed on a project that I was involved in with DARPA for a number of years to basically create a neuromorphic processor, a system using inorganic elements, right, that mimics the way that the brain works and make it into a chip. This chip is about yay big, right? This whole thing is a four by four grid. It's about this big, right? And this thing was able to show as of about six months ago, world-class performance in Im image recognition using deep learning, which is what your Google, you know, what, what Google is basically doing all the time. Now, instead of running at 10 megawatts, it ran at 250 milliwatts, right? right? So incredible gains in efficiency by redesigning the architecture, using biological inspiration for how it works. It actually uses spikes, right? Like the brain uses spikes. When it's not working, it needs no power, right? So there's a lot of different instantiations of the biological construct of the brain inside of this chip, right? This is one of many examples of different companies that are building new circuit architectures that leverage what the brain is doing to enhance efficiency and performance, right? So this is the type of computer when you, if you ever read a news story that can actually recognize images better than humans and it can do it thousands of times a second, right? These sorts of things. Now this all sounds great and slightly scary, right? Um, but it still struggles in a certain regard with the fact that the system is designed to do certain things, right? And it doesn't necessarily do things particularly well when we start to have to deal with interactions of things, right? When we have to start to take data sets that don't mesh well together, when it starts to be asked questions that it hasn't seen before, right? Whereas you, all of you, not all of you, not this row, I recognize them, but I just met a number of you, right? Like I could probably see you tomorrow having only seen you once and remember who you are, right? Or I could see your face with half of it obscured and know who you are, right? Because I don't need tons and tons of data. Somehow our brains are able to do things without statistical amounts of information, right? And this scales upwards. As we start to think about all the interactions that are everywhere around us, it can become very, very difficult to think about how traditional computers can handle the fact that a human is not a machine, right? We've liked to make analogies between humans as physical systems and draw them like robots as machines, right? Did I use another slide like this? There's a thing called a Vaucanson duck, which is in the medieval times they used to make robotic ducks that would eat and walk and quack and poop, right? But it's not a duck just because it looks and walks and talks like a duck, right? It's still a machine, right? So we can't necessarily just think about the fact that if we put all the bits together, that we're going to get what happens in a natural complex system. Just like back to my example of the school of fish, or back to if you go far enough back, I'm not going to take credit for this, Aristotle, right, thousands of years ago said, the sum is more, you know, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. You can't just take a bunch of fish and stick them together and think that you're going to get some predictable behavior. We don't know why they flock and school the way that they do. There's all sorts of emergent properties in natural systems that cover all sorts of different ranges of our human experience, including activity in the human brain, that are the consequence of all these interactions, right? Between all the little parts, all the data interacting together, right? And this is where even the current versions of these very, very high level fancy machines sort of fall off. They struggle a little bit. Now this is not something that anyone doesn't know. We all know this. This is what we're trying to address. If we now flash back again to Alan Turing, there was another paper that he, did, that he wrote that no one ever really looked at, which was called an unorganized machine. So instead of these nice little patterned crossbars where everything is controlled and we know exactly what everything is and where it all is at all times, he had an idea of what if we actually put together a network of these elements where it was totally unorganized and you just fed it information and let the information flow through it. It's like sort of if you watch the emergent spatial patterns in your brain, right, when it's stimulated by light or by signal and sound, like watching this. And he showed a long time ago in math that these are actually universal. These types of machines can carry out any calculation with equivalent efficiency. The problem is how do you make something like that, right? How do you build it? So I'm not going to get into too much into my work. I haven't talked really at all about my stuff. Uh, we do have a project in this regard where we're using those memristors and putting them into self-organized networks that are biologically inspired. 
like the neural pill of the, of, the, of, the cort or of the cortex, basically a highly interconnected network of inorganic synapses that interact and receive signals. These are the chips, you can hold them in your hands. Inside the center are billions of interconnections, these little synapses, and then we sort of look and see how the emergent properties come out and how we might leverage those to do computation. So this is a uh, sort of one slide description of it. If you want to read anything more about it, there was an LA Times article in 2014 about these things. This is actually a wafer of them, but nevertheless, we do some work in this regard here at UCLA. There's sort of an emerging body of research in different disciplines and in different areas, mostly in the School of Engineering, but there are some people in the medical school, especially in the computational neuroscience sides of things, um, that are sort of exploring brain dynamics as a sort of foundation for uh, building new computers. So we're almost done, two more slides. Looking ahead, right? I gave you sort of a historical story, right? We came through trying to s make things smaller, right? And most of what we were making, whether we were building you know, from the top down or from the bottom up, were basically passive, right? They were just sort of there. Then there was a period of time where we started to do things that actually did things, right? Active materials that we could leverage their properties. We then have sort of in this space now where we're trying to integrate different materials together, right? How do we put those bricks together? We've got this really cool brick, and it's got this really interesting property, but how do we put it where we want it to do without having to place it one by one by one, right? We don't have an army of people carrying the bricks along to place them. We want them to do them by themselves. How do we integrate them into devices that don't necessarily use the same technologies that we use for miniaturization? And then we're sort of moving into this space where you see a lot more of the nano bioengineering interface, really merging different approaches to designing next generation nano scale systems, devices, materials to solve all the large scale problems, these grand challenges that face us. So if you ask me at the beginning, none of you did, but I asked myself, uh, what is nano, right? Um, the easy answer is it's small, right? What I would say is, is it's not just things that are small, right? It's not just shrinking things down to make them more efficient. Right, to make them consume less power, to make them faster. It's thinking about how you can understand that there's a unique property of this material, something that only exists because it's small, and how do you then utilize that to build something useful, something meaningful, something that can't be done if it were large. Right? It's rethinking what it is to not just shrink things down, but to take the properties, the exciting, unique properties of these things when they're small and put them to some useful end. Right. So with that, I'll just thank everyone who collaborates with me, uh, who pays the bills, and you for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And if you don't have any questions now, you can find me at CNSI or shoot me an email anytime. Um, I probably answer my email too much. At least that's what my wife tells me. But uh, when they're good questions, I'm happy to. So with that, I'll turn it over if anyone has any questions. <laughs>